freedom, uh, keys to leading a blessed life, and uh, there are certain things that God wants you to believe and do in order for your life to be blessed. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in a continuation this morning. Last week, uh, Brother Clyde gave us a message about Peter in Matthew chapter 16, having the keys uh, to the kingdom given to him by Jesus, and how that, uh, those keys are sharing the gospel, sharing the message of Jesus uh, with other people, and specifically also with ourselves. We need the gospel to share um, and open up God's blessings for us. And today, the next key in the series is faith. And I don't know about you, but uh, when it comes to keys, I am not really that great. Uh, Clyde gave you some stories last week about keys, and for me, I lose my keys all the time. It's, it's actually quite ridiculous. If you talk to my wife, Angel, she will tell you that I lose my keys all the time. It's, it's a habit of mine. Specifically this morning, I forgot my phone. I have no clue where my phone is. And uh, I don't know about you, but if things aren't in the same place every time, uh, then I forget them. People try to give me drive-bys, like, hey, will you remember to tell your wife this? I say, nope. <laughs> I will not remember. Angel, she'll ask me to do something in the morning, and if it's not already part of my ritual, I will forget. Uh, my mind just operates in a certain mode, and uh, sometimes I don't remember things like that. But one specific time when I lost my keys, uh, I was going fishing, and I had just bought this, this really small rust bucket boat that was made out of aluminum. It was like 14 feet long and only about 30 inches wide, and so you couldn't really stand up in it. You know, you had to hover really low. And I was really excited. My first fishing boat, I really do enjoy fishing. I haven't done it in a while just because life gets crazy. But so I uh, took this boat and I painted it up, and um, I had this trailer for it, and the bad part about the trailer is you had to actually get in the water to unload the boat. It's like, what's the point? This is pointless. The whole point of having a trailer is so you don't have to get wet, irregardless. So I load the boat in the water one morning. I'm going fishing. It's early spring, so the water's still really cold. And, uh, and I get out to the deck, and I've got my keys. I usually have my keys on a lanyard around my neck, but I'm really excited about going fishing. And so I detach my keys. I usually lock my phone in my truck, you know, because if your boat sinks, you don't want to be without a phone. So I, I unload my boat in the water. I tie the boat to the deck. And, uh, and I go and I take my truck and I park it and I come back and I'm trying to get the boat set up and I'm really excited and I'm moving on my fishing poles and, and getting set and, I, and I'm bending down and I'm working and then I stand up. I forgot to clip my keys back to my lanyard. My keys fall in the water. Not even joking you. They fell in the water and I have a moment of panic. What do I do? I mean, do I try to fish them out? I really don't want to jump in the water because it's cold. Other people are waiting because they want to fish too. And so I'm like stuck in this split second panic mode because the, de the, the boat, the water, it's like, I don't know how deep this is. It looks like it's like six or seven feet deep. And my keys, they have my truck keys, my house keys. I mean, all of my keys are in the water and it's like six o'clock in the morning. What do you do? I decided to undress myself. <laughs> I undressed myself except for my shorts, AKA my underwear. And I, you can only imagine, like, why is this person getting undressed on the dock? And so I take my clothes off, I put them in the boat, and then I jump in the water, and it is freezing cold. I am like, it is ridiculous. And I don't do well with cold water. I do not, I told you about this a few months ago, right? I'm the guy, you have to just jump in, but it shocks my system so bad. And I can't see where my keys have fallen. That's the worst part. I don't know where they are. And so I'm like literally searching the bottom of the water with my feet as I'm hanging on to the deck, praying, Lord Jesus, please help me find my keys. And I found my keys. I was so excited. I got out, got back on the deck, tried to dry myself off, got in the boat, and I went fishing, had my keys on me. And I didn't let them go. But there is something about keys, obviously, that's really important. I wouldn't have been able to get my phone to call for help because my keys are locked in my truck. I wouldn't be able to drive home. I wouldn't be able to access my house. And so keys are this really vital thing that we need to function our lives. They unlock things. They open things up. And that is how the keys work in our message series. We are talking about something that God has given us to open up access, not only to himself, but to his kingdom. And so when we deal with this, this, this idea of faith, unfortunately, a lot of people think that faith is when you take a blind step into the darkness. You don't really know what you're reaching for. You're kind of like me. You can't really see anything. You kind of think that it's there, but you're just hoping that maybe you find it if you kick enough dust around. A lot of people think that 
That's what faith is. Uh, They say that faith is uh, belief in spite of evidence, or faith is what defies reason. And when the gospel writers use the word faith, that was the farthest thing from their minds. Faith was a decision based off of what you do see, based of what, of what you do experience. John said something like this, we saw Jesus, we touched Jesus, we ate with Jesus, we experienced Jesus, we were around Jesus, and so we made a decision to believe in the resurrection because of what we saw. And so we cannot think that faith is this blind step in the darkness or just going off of what we do not really have reason or evidence for. Faith is based on reason. So people say things, well, you just have to have faith. And yes, faith is important. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, the Bible says this, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, it's not a matter of whether or not faith is based on reason or not. What we need to understand is if we have biblical faith, our faith will be based on the content of what our faith is. Faith is belief that. Think of it in that way. Faith is belief that God resurrected Jesus from the dead. Faith is belief that God exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him. Faith is what we uh, contend or what we have there to have access to. That's the real idea of faith. Faith is not bossing God around. Have you ever seen people on TV, the name it and claim it uh, faith people? You know what I'm talking about? If you name it and you claim it, God will give it to you. That's like my best voice that I can use to interpret that. That is garbage, right? Faith is not name it and claim it and bossing God around. Faith is not buying a fake little towel or a little bit of oil or some statue hoping that it will bring you something from God because your faith demands God's actions. That is not the biblical definition of faith. You have mystics also. They believe faith is, well, I don't care what the facts are. I'm just going to believe anyways. That is not biblical faith. Dr. Roger Chambers put it like this. Faith may take us beyond our information and our ability to handle information, like the Trinity, for instance, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing triune but yet one. Faith may take us beyond our information and our ability to understand information, he says. But faith never causes us to abandon the laws of logic. Faith is reason grown bold and courageous. That's what faith is. Faith is reason grown bold and courageous. And so if you'll turn to Romans chapter 4, this is where we're going to be for the majority of this morning, talking about this idea of faith. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, and the Romans have a problem. The Romans' problem uh, is is that they're consisted of people who disagree about life. (laughs) Go figure, right? A group of people who disagree about life. And the Roman church was made up of two groups of people, Jews, who were now Jewish Christians, and Gentiles, who were non-Jewish Christians. And Gentiles could be anybody that is not a Jew. And so they have a problem because the Jews think that because we have the flesh of Abraham, we have the favor of God, right? An analogy is is that like people who are Americans think that they're better because they're American citizens. They're better than other people in the world. Not saying that anybody in here thinks that, but there are people out there who believe that. Because I'm an American, I'm better than everyone else. And so these Jews thought, because I have the flesh, uh, I am favored by God. They believed salvation was by race instead of grace. And so you got the Apostle Paul coming along and saying, oh, no, Jewish Christians, you've got it all messed up. It's not your flesh that matters, it's your faith of Abraham that matters. It's not salvation by race, being a Jew, it's salvation by grace, being a gift from God. And so they have this contention, but Paul basically tells them this, everyone's got the same problem, which is sin, right? Both Jews and Gentiles, you have the same problem, sin. And everyone's got the same answer, which is grace. And so he gives them this dissertation of their their faith, and what they should believe, and how they should model their faith, and who they should follow. And so he says, because there's no distinction between us, we are all part of the same family. And so a key phrase that he focuses in here is simply this, the Jews thought that they were chosen to rule, when in fact they were chosen to serve. They were chosen to serve, to bring about the Messiah. 
You know, I don't know about you, but when I first got married, I really thought that uh, I was the person in charge. I thought that as the leader of the family, it's my way or the highway, my decision's it, and boy, did that cause me a lot of problems, right? I mean, the Bible's very clear. Ephesians chapter 5, right? Husbands should lead and be the head of their household, but lead in such a way as Christ led the church. And what did Jesus do? He gave himself up for the church. He led sacrificially, right? I mean, that's the whole point of a Christian husband. Christian husbands should be the greatest husbands on the face of this earth because they lead their wives sacrificially. They take their wives' thoughts and feelings into account when they do render the decision. Likewise, how about some women, right? There are some women who get married to think that they are the official administrators of the relationship, right? They do think sometimes, some women, not saying anybody in here ever would think that, but some women do believe that they are the official governors of the relationship, and they not only take care of their children, but also their husbands, who acts like a child. And so both people can come into a relationship, the point being, with a misconception. Wives are called to respectfully follow their husbands and to submit to them, like Sarah did to Abraham in calling him Lord, uh, that she would not be underneath his feet or over his head, but that she would walk with him by her side. And that's kind of the idea that we come to with this Christian church, as they have this misconception of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so look at Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Look what Paul has to say. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be in accordance with grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all. The first thing that he starts off with here is that Abraham's flesh never made a person a child of God, only having Abraham's faith. Very, very important distinction. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you've come from, uh, what type of category that you're in monetarily. Those things don't matter. What does matter? Having the faith of Abraham. And, the, and I'm not trying to bash Jewish people here or the Jews of the first century. I'm just trying to provide a proper context to the scripture. Let me give you an example, right? What is a true Jew today? Uh, think about that in your mind. Who, what is a true biblical Jew? Did you know that Abraham was not a Jew? Abraham was not an Israelite. Abraham was not a Hebrew. Abraham was not born, and he did not worship in Jerusalem. And so we have this understanding of the word Jew. The word Jew means one who praises God. And so the Apostle Paul, who is a Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was one of the top leaders in the Jewish world at that time. This is what he writes about what it means to be a true Jew now that Christ has died on the cross. He says this in, in chapter 2 of Romans, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he who is a Jew is one who is inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter, the letter meaning the Old Testament. And his praise is not from men, but is from God. And so when we come to this idea of what it means to be a worshiper and a follower of God, what it means to be a true Jew, what it means to be a true Israelite, the example that he gives is that we've got to be like Abraham if we want to have the key of faith. And so that's what I want to take you through this morning. I want to take you through Abraham. I want to show you how if you model yourself after Abraham, you will have the true biblical key of faith that God wants you to have. And this is really good news because you know what? Abraham is pretty much the action hero uh, of, of the Bible. I don't know if anybody cashed in on the Marvel movie weekend. Uh, if you didn't, you know, sorry for you. But I was able to watch different Marvel uh, movies this week, and I had, we all have heroes, right? People that we look up to, um, different models that we want to go after. And today there's, man, you get on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, uh, you know there are a lot of different types of heroes that people seek to follow. Uh, whether people look like really in shape like myself, you know, I could be a hero for people. That's supposed to be a joke, you're supposed to laugh. But people model themselves after people who are well fit people who are great musicians, movie actors, uh, you know, people who are smart, uh, really, really smart geniuses, um, people who are philosophers, people who are sport athletes, whatever. People look at that person and they say, man, I would love to be that person. I want to be successful like that person. Let me model myself like them 
and maybe one day I will become like them. Now, what about the scriptures? God says, I want you to be like Abraham. I want you to have his faith. And this is so encouraging to me because Abraham was a complete knucklehead sometimes. I mean, he disobeyed God. He lied. Uh, he, he made a ton of mistakes. And so God pointing to this imperfect man who had incredible faith, that means that God can use somebody like me. That means that God is willing to work with my mistakes, my failures, and I can actually have the faith that God wants me to have even though I make mistakes and I mess up. And that's not only good news for me, but that's, that's good news for you as well. God uses imperfect people to accomplish his goals. Praise God. And so let's look at the two examples uh, of faith that we have here. First of all, in Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 17, uh, the Apostle Paul gives us two examples. He says, as it is written, speaking of to Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations, and the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, Abraham believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, and has been told, so your offspring shall be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. This is hilarious, by the way, and I'll show you why. Since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. If you're sitting here thinking, I have no idea what's going on right now, because you don't know the story of Abraham, don't worry, we're going to get there. There are two things that Abraham faced, two problems, so to speak, that Abraham overcame that serve as a model for our faith. Here's the first one, was the problem of producing a promised child. God told Abraham, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. Abraham lived about 4,000 years ago in the land of Ur. Um, he was a moon worshiper. He worshiped this false god. And God came to Abraham because God knew that Abraham would be the type of man that could have true faith. And so God in Genesis, and you could read about this in Genesis chapter 15 and 16, God calls this man Abraham out of his land to a promised land. Along the way, Abraham makes mistakes. He goes down into Egypt, gets himself into trouble, lies. And, uh, and so he ends up getting called back out into the promised land. And along this way, God told Abraham, hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child, and he's going to be your blessed child, and you're going to make uh, an incredible family. You're going to be the father of many nations. And so Abraham stood on this promise. He believed that God would bless him like this. Only one problem. He was almost 100 years old, still no child. Now think about that for a minute. This is hilarious, like that Roman says this. <laughs> He considered his own body, which was as good as dead. PG-13, meaning certain things weren't operating like they should, okay? I mean, think about it. This dude's 100 years old, right? Sarah's womb, for instance, is dead. They've been trying to conceive for many, many years, no child. And so, like any rational person, he decides to get hitched up with a few other women and produces other children, which will certainly solve the problem, right? Bringing more complication into the relationship. Yeah, it doesn't work. So finally, God gives him the promised child, Isaac. And Isaac turns 16. And let's just say for the sake of fun that it's Isaac's 16th birthday. And so God says, okay, now that I've given you this promised child, I want you to kill him. Think about that for a minute. This promise that Abraham had been holding on to, God says, I want you to sacrifice him to me uh, for, for my glory. Now here are these two examples. Abraham believed that God could bring life from non-life, that we read, God could speak into existence that which does not exist. A foundational building block for Abraham's faith was creationism, was God's all-powerfulness, that God could bring life from non-life is a sheer miracle. And so what caused Abraham to serve as the model of faith is that he trusted God's promise. When God said, I am going to give you a promised child, the barrenness of Sarah's womb and the brokenness of his own body did not hinder Abraham from believing that God would come through. That's point number one. Point number two, when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his most prized, valued possession, and I want you to think for a minute, what is the most important thing to you in your life? Like something that you would not be willing to give up. Is it your children? Is it your relationship with Jesus? 
Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's something that, that you have, a material possession. Think about that thing which you hold most dearly that you would give your life for in an instance. And then think about God asking you to give that up. And then magnify that by a hundred, and then you've probably got how Abraham felt when God said, give me your son, your one and only son. And so what did Abraham do? Well, he took a few of his companions, he took his son Isaac, he came to a mountain, and he said, come on Isaac, we're going to go up and we're going to worship the Lord. But this is what he said in Genesis 22. He turned back to his followers, his companions who had come with him along this journey, and he said, we are going to return after we worship. Think about that for a moment. We are going to return after we worship. But wait a minute. You're going to this mountain to sacrifice your son. What makes you think that you're going to come back with him? He's going to be dead. Well, we find out in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God would be able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. And so the second thing that Abraham overcame was the proposition to surrender his promised child. This is what makes Abraham the model of faith. He trusted God's promises that led to action. Could we have ever looked back at Abraham's life and said, yeah, Abraham was a guy who trusted God if he never obeyed, if he never followed through? If he never offered Isaac or believed that Sarah could produce a child? Well, certainly not. And how do we know whether or not you trust God? Well, let's, let's look at your life. Are you walking and trusting God with your life? Are you believing in the promises that God has saved you, that God loves you, that God works all things out to the good for those who are called according to his purpose? Do you believe in the promises of God? Do you believe that God won't give you anything more than you can handle? Do you believe that God has saved you and on the final day you will stand before him blameless, spotless, whole? Well, how do we know? Well, let's look at your lifestyle. You see, the key phrase is simply this. In both cases, Abraham believed in an all-powerful creator who can bring the dead back to life again. This is the content of Abraham's faith. Abraham believed that God could bring Isaac back from the dead. Abraham believed that God could give him a child, even when it seemed impossible. And look at this, and I have this up on the screen for you. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, God says this to Abraham. He gives him this promise after he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. By the way, he didn't go through with it. God was putting him through a test. That test, sorry parents, is not for you too, okay? This is for Abraham only. You don't have to kill your children, right? This, this is a, a test that God gave Abraham, and Abraham passed it. So right before he killed Isaac, God stopped him and said, look, you followed through, you passed the test. And in verse 17, he says, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because you obeyed my voice. You did what I asked you to do. Aren't there some weird things in Christianity? Like, think about this for a minute. Pretend you've never been in the church, you've never heard about Jesus, and somebody comes up to you and says, oh, by the way, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to immerse your body in water, and the Holy Spirit's going to come live inside of your life. I mean, I would be like, that is really weird. I, think about it. Like, there's this mystical thing that goes on in your life, and I have to, like, get inside of a big bucket of water for it to actually happen. I mean, people would probably look at you and say, wow, that is really awkward. But God tells us to do things like that. Repent and be baptized, every, every one of you, in Jesus' name, is what Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says. And so there are certain things in your life that you can do that determines whether or not you are in a trusting relationship with God. And so if you want to be a child of God, you have to have Abraham's faith. Remember, it doesn't matter whether or not you're an American citizen or a Jew or you come to church every Sunday. What is the content of your faith? You see, Abraham trusted in God because he reasoned. He contemplated, which means he used his mind. He thought about this. It had to be rational. It had to make sense. And so Christianity is built off of rationality and truth and what we experience. Look what Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 4, verse 20. This is why Abraham was so great. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith giving glory to God. 
You see, true biblical faith puts the spotlight on God and takes the spotlight off of ourselves and the people around us. It gives glory to God. Dr. Jack Cottrell put it like this. Justifying faith is faith in God and in what he has done and promises to do. Rather than a reliance upon ourselves and what we are able to achieve, faith by its very nature puts ourselves in the background and turns the spotlight back on God. In other words, faith uses your life in every way to bring glory to God. If God can create the world from nothing, if God can raise a dead body back to life, if God could raise uh, Sarah's womb back to life, if God could bring Isaac back to life, can God heal your broken marriage? Absolutely. Can God heal your broken financial situation? Absolutely. If God can do this, God certainly can do that. Can God bring you back to life spiritually? Absolutely. This is the content of Abraham's faith. I can trust in God's promises because of what I've experienced, what I've seen, what makes sense. And so that's the encouragement that we can walk away with this morning. And look, look at what Abraham's faith le led to in verse 21. And being fully assured that what God had promised, what was he able to do? He was able to perform. Being fully assured and convicted, he was able to do, to act. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Man, there's nothing better than seeing that check show up on Friday. You know what I mean? Your bank account has been credited with money that you've worked for and that you've earned, and it feels great. Well, imagine somebody putting money in your account every day that you didn't earn, and they said, look, I just want to give this to you for free. That would be incredible, right? That would be awesome. And that's what God does. That's what it means to have righteousness reckoned to you, is that God takes his righteousness and he puts it in your bank account, so to speak. But I want to focus in on something. He was, first of all, fully assured of God's promises. He didn't base his faith off of what he didn't know. He based his faith off of what he did know. This verb, fully assured, means to be fully convinced, to be fully persuaded in what? and God's promises. He trusted in God's promises. You see, trusting God requires us to not only believe in his promises, but believe that he has the ability to keep his promises. And this is why it's so relevant. Do you ever feel like you're not saved? I mean, think about that. You get messed up in sin, you make a mistake, you do well one day, a few days later you fall into temptation, and you almost feel like salvation is this spiritual yo-yo that God constantly puts down in your life and takes away when you're messed up and you make a mistake. Our problem isn't our sin. Our problem is believing the gospel, trusting in God's promises. If God promises to save you, and if you are faithful, God says, look, if you're faithful to me, I have to be faithful to you. I promise you this. Can you trust in God's promise? Can you trust in God's promise to save you? Absolutely. So I think one of the things that you can do is get rid of your spiritual yo-yo. Stop doubting whether or not God loves you, whether or not God wants to save you, whether or not God wants to work in your life, and sit back and rest in the peace of God that he does love you. He does want a relationship with you. He does want to save you. And so a key phrase that we could focus in on is this. Stop worrying and examining your personal work meter in order to make a guess about your salvation. Instead, the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Don't try to work your way to heaven doubting God's promises to save you by grace through faith. Don't think that God doesn't love you because you mess up and you make mistakes. Don't try to outwork God and try to make your own salvation self-sufficient. Trust in the promises and the love of God and allow that peace to secure your life and stop worrying and doubting whether or not you'll make it. It's what we call a heavenly hope. Well, I hope I'll get there one day. No, you can be fully assured just like Abraham. You see, getting our eyes off of ourself and focusing on Jesus, we can look at the content of our faith. Look at verse 23 of Romans 4. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but also for our sake to whom it will be credited. As to those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Everything in the Old Testament was written for who? For our benefit. That when we look at somebody like Abraham and we can see how God credited righteousness to him, we can have peace knowing that God credits righteousness to us. And so there are two questions that I want to leave you with this morning. Do you trust God 
Do you trust God? For those of you who are Christians, well, you could answer that by saying, am I laying up treasure in heaven now that I'm a Christian? Am I trying to make my salvation self-sufficient? Am I laying up treasure in heaven with God? Am I more concerned about my financial, material, physical security here in this life? Or am I laying up treasure in heaven? That's a question that you can ask yourself. Here's the second question. Have you been baptized into Christ? You see, when my keys fell into the water, I had to make a decision, obviously, uh, whether or not I wanted to not have keys for a while or whether or not I wanted to get my keys and go on with my life. And so I had to make a decision to strip off my clothes, completely humiliating, get down into the water, and find my key. And that, that was my responsibility. Now, I could never have said and look back at that moment, yeah, I, I trusted in my abilities to get my keys. I could have never have said that if I never got into the water. My keys would still be there. My faith in myself would be not faith. And that's the same way it is with following after Jesus. When you look at your life, if you are a Christian here this morning, you have to ask yourself, have I declared my faith in Jesus by obeying the gospel, having faith, turning away from my sin, and being baptized into Christ? Are you willing to get into the water? And if you think of it like this, uh, being somebody who is outside of Christ is a lot like drowning. I don't know if you've ever drowned before. Uh, obviously not, you're still here. Or in the process of drowning, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever had any problems in water, maybe swimming. And what is, you know, you watch TV shows or something like that, or maybe you've even seen something live. And what's the person usually doing? They're kicking, they're thrashing, they're throwing their arms around. I mean, they're, they're, they're drowning, right? I mean, they're drowning. When I was on vacation uh, a few years ago, we were at uh, Outer Banks, and the waves actually really started picking up. And uh, we're sitting on the beach with a few friends, uh, Billy Dyer and uh, Matt Lambros, a uh, few guys who um, have been in this church. Uh, Matt's still a teacher here. And, and we were sitting there, and we're hanging out, reading our books, and we see this young lady. She's probably 9 or 10 years old, and she's out in the ocean, and there's this large rock. I mean, it's probably about as long as this aisle here. And she's, she's out there swimming, having fun, and the waves started picking up. And next thing you know, you see her fighting against, against the ocean. Uh, and she just totally surrenders and gives up and I thought that at first she was playing but all of a sudden I realized like this girl is drowning she's gonna die and so uh, I get up and start going and because I'm not as other uh, Billy actually ran beat beat me to the water and he jumped in and uh, he, he got her and he saved her and she could have easily have died uh, but more so if she was kicking and fighting him along the way there's no possible way he could have ever have saved her I don't want you to think about that for a moment that God wants to save us and we can't kick and thrash and fight him throughout the process. We have to have peace and let God come into our lives and surrender our will to him. Not fighting, not pushing back, but simply accepting him like a lifeguard would save us from the ocean. And so that's why as we finish out Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5 begins with this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is an incredible promise. That is an incredible occurrence that to no longer fight against God, to come to the point in your life where you can have peace. You don't have to worry about your salvation. You can simply accept God's grace in your life. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for all of us. And so we're going to pass around offering. Uh, at this moment, we're going to pray over offering, but we're also going to sing this song of invitation. And this is a moment for you to be able to come forward and decide whether or not you want to accept God's love and forgiveness for your life, whether or not you want to become a Christian. And you know what? Maybe, maybe you don't like big crowds, maybe coming up front, just sitting here thing. Well, this is also that opportunity to take your connection card and fill it out and mark on there whether or not you want to learn about becoming a Christian and learn about getting baptized and put that in the offering plate as it gets passed by. So I'm going to ask that you stand and you pray with me as we sing the song of invitation. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to encounter your grace. We thank you for people like Abraham who were messed up, who were broken, who made mistakes. But God, he definitive moments in life, he was able to show us what it means to have faith. That it's not just believing certain abstract ideas, but beliefs to carry to obeying you. 
God, I pray for this person who hasn't been followed, who hasn't modeled their faith like Abraham. God, I pray that they would be willing to look at what the New Testament has to say about salvation and put their lives on the line and place their lives in your resting arm. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we ask that you bless this offering that we give, that you multiply it, that you cause it to be able to produce um, many great wonders and works in your kingdom, that we could change our community, change our state, change the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.